into a little bit more about that. So I have no conflicts of interest uh, to declare. Uh, so some of the objectives uh, real quick, just we wanna identify the candidates for COVID-19 according to CDC guidance, uh, determine what COVID testing options are available and approved by the FDA and list the requirements for pharmacists to legally and safely collect COVID-19 specimens. And then for technician objectives, they're similar. We wanna see who can obtain COVID-19 testing, uh, recognize the patient characteristics that warrant pharmacist assessment. And we wanna list the requirements for pharmacists to legally and safely collect COVID-19 specimens. Uh, so just a pre-question, uh, which of the following is true regarding COVID-19 tests? Oh, there we go. and most people are muted, so we're, we're going to keep them muted until the question and answer part. Sure, sounds good. Uh, I've seen it. a couple of people are saying D, and that would be correct. Uh, the state of Illinois is working toward the goal of uh, getting more testing available. Uh, recent travel from mainland China is not required anymore. Um, most test results are really, it takes a few hours for most of the tests right now. And the use of PPE is always going to be required if we're interacting with COVID patients. Uh, so early February, or late January, early February, the CDC kind of published their original criteria for testing. And basically there were three different options. One, if you had a fever or signs and symptoms of a lower respiratory tract infection, and then you also had to have close contact with a laboratory confirmed COVID-19 patient within 14 days. It was a little difficult because not a lot of patients were getting tested. So we didn't have a lot of patients who would meet that criteria. The second option was fever and signs and symptoms of a lower respiratory tract infection and then travel history from the province in China where COVID-19 is thought to originated. And then the third option was fever and signs and symptoms again, and then travel from mainland China anywhere in China. So February 27th, these actually got changed. Uh, so the first one is very sim is the same exact thing. Uh, the second option where the, it was the Providence in China, it's actually now any affected geographic location if you had traveled there. And then the third option changed from mainland China to if you required a hospitalization and there was no alternative diagnosis that they were able to find. Um, so as of March 24th, it was about three weeks ago, these were changed by the CDC and they kind of abandoned the system that they had and now it's separated down into priorities. Uh, priority one, so we want to ensure optimal care options. Basically that means we want to make sure anyone who's going to be in the hospital where these patients can get sick or patients are already sick, we don't want to risk the spread even further. So we kind of want to be able to test the hospitalized patients and symptomatic healthcare workers first. Priority two, um, is then the highest risk of complications. So older patients, uh, patients in long-term care facilities, if they have underlying conditions or if they're first responders, um, those are would be deemed priority two for testing. Priority three then is basically as resources allow, if we have testing available, we would like to get these tested, but not over priority one or priority two patients. And basically that's uh, critical infrastructure workers who are symptomatic or those who are symptomatic in communities with high COVID-19 rates. And then the non-priority would be individuals without symptoms. So that's kind of like last line. Those were the people we would test if we had enough tests to test everybody. Um, so we've heard a lot about all these different tests that are getting approved and medications that we can use for COVID. But I think it's important to talk about these are all approved under an emergency use authorization. So that's very different than FDA approval. So it still comes from the FDA, but on February 4th, the Department of Health and Human Services said that we could use COVID-19 tests under an emergency use authorization. Um, as of today, I looked this morning, there were 35 different tests that were approved under this EUA. Um, and the big differences here are gonna be in the strictness of how, it, how FDA requires their testing. So the diagnostic tests are only allowed during the public health emergency, if they're authorized under the EUA. After this public health emergency is over, these tests would have to go through formal FDA approval, which is, a, as like my next point says, a lot more strict in terms of what the FDA is looking for. And because of that, 
the FDA isn't the one who's assessing the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, all those kind of numbers we look at to determine if testing is good or if it's uh, something that we're not really going to get a lot of benefit from. Uh, so in terms of testing availability, specifically in Illinois, March 29th, the Illinois was able to run 4,000 tests in a day. And at that time, Governor Pritzker wanted to increase the number to 10,000 tests in a day. Um, April 8th, the goal that he had said for 10,000 tests, unfortunately, we didn't meet that. We were only at 6,000 tests per day at a maximum throughout the laboratories in Illinois. And part of the reason for that is we had obtained, as a state, five high volume RNA extractors for testing. But due to the accuracy, the state doesn't feel comfortable using these as much for the testing of these patients. So we weren't able to get that number up as high as we would like it to. And then he also stated that Illinois plans to use our state supply of raw materials because there's worldwide shortages everywhere. So we, we need to all pool our resources together, basically. And then currently, IDPH is only testing patients who are hospitalized with a lower respiratory illness, unless there's extenuating circumstances. And those labs are located in Chicago, Springfield, and Carbondale. So they're very far apart, and there's only three of them in the state. Um, and then this is the number of tests that Illinois has performed. So on April 5th, we had around 59,000 te patients tested. And 10 days later, yesterday, we actually had 111,000 patients tested. So approximately 5,000 tests a day that we've been doing. We've almost doubled the amount of patients tested in 10 days. So that's, we're moving in the right direction, but we're still a little bit further behind than we would like to be. Um, locations in, 15, in seven different states. Um, some of those will be in Illinois that they said. And then CVS is also moving to have certain locations allow in-store testing. I'm not sure exactly where in Illinois those will, will be though. Um, and then still, unfortunately, most testing facilities are still going to require a physician order or authorization from a physician for patients to get tested. You know, so what is the pharmacist role in testing? So on April 8th, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services issued a statement. I, I don't want to read it word for word to you, but basically they said that pharmacists are on the front line of this uh, pandemic and we're going to have the authorization to order and administer COVID-19 testing. Uh, community pharmacists are on the front line of this pandemic right now and the ability to authorize testing is a really great step. Um, APHA is working with the other uh, national organizations right now to find guidance, training, and ensuring payment for services as well. Um, so what is the pharmacy going to need to be able to act on that and be able to actually test patients? So one, we're going to need a CLIA waiver. Uh, CMS has guidance on how to apply for that if your pharmacy doesn't already have one. Uh, whoever is administering the test must receive training, one from a safety standpoint, liability standpoint. They need to know how to properly administer these tests and how to properly put on the personal protective equipment. So the personal protective equipment that we would like, uh, that would be required is gowns, gloves, an N95 respirator or a face mask if those aren't available, because I know those are in short supply, um, and eye protection as well. So proper training on how to use the PPE is also important, not only, not only just knowing how to use the test, because the improper donning and doffing or putting on taking off of PPE is actually one of the highest risks for contamination contamination of other surfaces. So it can actually cause a lot more issues if we're not properly putting those on and taking those off. And then if they were to send a pharmacy to send a specimen to an outside facility, they need to keep it cooled while the specimen is in transit and while they're holding it for it to be picked up. So how is the testing performed? The most common testing routes are nasopharyngeal swab and the oropharyngeal swab. The nasal is the most preferred um, because that has the, the most, the CDC is this, that's the most accurate that they've been able to find so far. Uh, the other routes that are available are saliva, which is only available in New Jersey right now, uh, bronchial alveolar lavage, sputum, tracheal aspirate, and blood specimen. We'll kind of get into this blood specimen in a little bit. 
Um, but most of the tests that we talked about that are going to be the nasal or the oral are going to be polymerase chain reaction or PCR testing. So basically that's going to detect the viral genome. Unfortunately, these tests can have up to a 30% false negative rate. Uh, there's not a lot of information available on the uh, false positive rate at this time. Like I said, uh, because these aren't going through the full FDA approval, we don't have a lot of that information available. Most PCR tests for other disease states and for COVID-19 take only a couple hours to result, but there's such high traffic that we're actually taking a day or multiple days to be able to get the results, unfortunately. And then Abbott Labs actually received uh, emergency youth authorization from the FDA for their point of care testing that takes up to five minutes, as little as five minutes to obtain a result. Uh, they plan to produce five million tests in the month of April. Uh, last I heard that the, the federal government was distributing these point of care tests throughout the states to the places they deemed were most necessary. So probably like New York and those areas where we know it's been hit really hard. Um, this can use the nasal, uh, nasal pharyngeal or sw throat swabs for this test. And then the other kind of testing that we have, this would be more for the blood that I kind of talked about is the antibody or the serology testing. So this would be able to detect COVID-19 IgG or IgM antibodies. So it's promising that we can see these antibodies in the blood because typically me that means with other disease states, we've built up an immunity. So we theoretically shouldn't be able to get the disease again. Unfortunately, this is a very new, it's only about three months old at this time. So we don't have a lot of information and we don't know if patients can get infected again or not. Um, theoretically, the goal of this would be allow, allowing patients to go back into the community knowing that they can't spread it and they can't get the disease. But uh, until we know more information, it's really hard to say what we, uh, what we can do with that. So the FDA uh, also has a warning that's required for all of these uh, antibody tests that they've approved. One saying that a negative test doesn't necessarily rule out COVID because it's looking for the antibodies, not the virus itself. So if it's very early in the disease course, we might not have the antibodies built up yet. Um, but positive results might also not indicate COVID-19 because there's other coronaviruses that are out there that it may be detecting those antibodies as well and um, giving a false positive in that case. So, and then there's a lot of patients, I'm sure I've had people come up and ask me, family members, what about this at-home test that I saw online or what can we do to make sure we get tested? Right now, the FDA does not have any at-home testing approved for, for COVID-19. They are looking into it. They're working as hard as they can to find one to get it approved, but right now they don't have any. So the only way to get tested is through licensed commercial or IDPH laboratories in Illinois. Um, some examples of things to look out for. One, if there's a phone call alerting patients they qualify for a free test kit, that's gonna be a no. Um, At-home use is a no. 100% accuracy or immediate test results, we just don't have those right now. So all of these are gonna indicate that these are probably a fraudulent test, trying to get people to pay money or give information out so they can use that for other purposes. <clears throat> so COVID-19 websites have also increased. So there's uh, over 100,000 new no domain names that have been registered since the start of the pandemic. Um, specifically including the word COVID, virus, or corona. Um, malware is also distinguishing itself as information based on COVID-19. So if you have a patient talking about something they read on the computer, make sure that you talk to them, make sure it's like a reputable place and they're not going to fishy areas of the internet that are possibly downloading viruses or buying things that are not going to help them. So where is this information at? Uh, all of this information is on the FDA's website. So medications, I kind of put the links in here. There's medications, biologics, the devices, um, the e emergency youth authorization approved test is that fourth link. And then the emergency youth authorization in general, just for COVID-19, including the information about medications is that last link that I posted there. And then where can we report some of this fraud if we're seeing any of that? So there's the FDA, the FTC, and the FCC. All of these are different avenues for reporting fraud, and it's important to make sure we do report these sites that are potentially scamming our patients or causing more harm than they are good. So I've got a couple questions here now at the end. I just wanted to go through. 
JS is a female patient who calls your community pharmacy with new onset symptoms, cough and fever. She has a medical history of type two diabetes, COPD, and currently smokes one and a half packs a day. She's wondering if she should contact her doctor about getting tested for COVID-19. Um, so should this patient be referred to the pharmacist for further screening? Yeah, so she has co-occurring conditions and she's having symptoms. Um, so we can have, refer her to the pharmacist to kind of assess the need for screening. So question two, same patient, um, now that she's seen the pharmacist, what category would she fall under for the CDC's priority for testing? Is that priority one, two, three, or would she be a non-priority? Yeah, so she would be a priority too, since she does have diabetes and COPD and she does smoke. She does have some co-occurring conditions that would put her in that category two, but she isn't hospitalized, which is why she's not or priority one. Um, so same patient again, she now has authorization from her physician to receive a COVID-19 test. Um, she wants to know where she can get tested, which is the most appropriate for her to get tested, knowing that she has mild symptoms. So we can go to the emergency room, uh, IDPH laboratory, an at-home test website she found, or at your pharmacy now offering tests. I'm seeing some Ds in the chat and that's correct. So the local hospital emergency room and IDPH are really only for like emergencies or hospitalized patients. And as I said, there's no at-home test approved currently. Uh, so a patient contacts your pharmacy. She wants to know uh, where she can get tested up for COVID-19. Um, but she's asymptomatic currently, but is very worried about the virus. Which of the following is appropriate counseling points for the pharmacist to provide? And this is a multiple answer one. So should she contact her for physician if she truly feels the need to be tested? Um, if she develops symptoms that are more severe to the point she can't breathe, she should go to the emergency room. C, she should request to go online to get an at-home test. Or D, alert her that she should try and stay home if possible. Yeah, so this is actually A, B, and D. Uh, all of these are uh, very valid one. If she really feels like she needs to be tested, she can contact her physician. And we don't want a, people to not go to the emergency room if they really are having a severe medical emergency, but we do want patients to stay home if they can. And then another select all that apply, which of the following is necessary for the pharmacy personnel to administer COVID-19 testing? Um, so hair cap, B gloves, C gown, D, N95 respirator, E, eye protection. So it's actually all of them except for the hair cap. We don't necessarily need to have a hair cap, but the gloves, gown, respirator, and eye protection all would be important for these, for, for a person collecting possible COVID-19 specimens to have. And with that, I, that's all I really have for uh, the presentation. I really thank you guys for tuning in. Do you guys have any questions at all for me? Tim, there was one question early in the um, in the chat. I'm not sure if you saw it or not, where they said they had a patient who was recently tested in the emergency department who came back positive for coronavirus, but not COVID-19. Do we know which test in Illinois will detect all coronavirus AV versus COVID-19? Um, so theoretically, the testing that they're doing should be testing for COVID-19. All of the things through the emergency youth authorization that are approved for testing COVID-19 are designed to be testing for COVID-19. Um, there's a couple others that I know of that they're testing for COVID-19, but also a bunch of other viral illnesses as well. So it might have been a case where they were on, it, was, it got sent on a viral panel that detected COVID-19 and other forms of the coronavirus. Um, but anyone that we send off a test for COVID-19 for, it should run a screening to determine if they have COVID-19 or not.
Another question, do you know any skilled nursing facilities that are um, testing and billing for COVID-19? I do not, not off the top of my head. Um, I don't know if any skilled nursing facilities are doing that. I, I'm sure some of them will start once they get more testing available, but right now the, the testing supplies are very limited. So I don't know that a lot of them even have it. I know there's a, Sabi's got a question about where we can get training to perform tests. Um, that's one thing that I was going to uh, put in here as an, as, a, as an appendix on statements. Um, IPHA through NASPA um, is working and through APHA, Starla and I both are working um, through double pronged on this. We're part of multiple work groups right now on a national level as we try to figure out how pharmacist testing, pharmacist billing, what training is going to be needed and all that, trying to figure out how we can get all of those puzzle pieces work together because the government just said we have the authority and they didn't give us a lot of other guidance. <laughs> so trying to find the best proper billing mechanisms, trying to make sure we stay away from the PBMs from getting involved at all. And um, so there's gonna be a lot of questions that need to be answered so we can try to get this eligible for the next 30 to 45 days to have us ready. Um, that's one thing to remember. You know, there's not a lot of supply, so it's not like pharmacies can start doing this tomorrow. Um, that will change over the coming days and weeks as we start to get more supply. Um, does anyone have any questions or want to raise their hand while we have 10 before we switch over into the regular program and, and give you guys your code? All right. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm going to switch back over co-hosts. Thank you. Thank you. And I saw what there was a question on immunization update. One of the things to remind everyone is that uh, the CDC is recommending um, not doing face-to-face -face interactions with preventative services unless it's absolutely necessary right now. So if you have a patient who needs to have an immunization and based on the risk, that's something that you're going to need to evaluate between you and the patient. And, um, but right now the CDC is asking you to postpone those preventative face-to-face -face encounters right now. Uh, let's switch over to your code. Hang on one second. And actually, since I got control of record, we'll resume the recording here. Um, as we've got Tim with us through the rest of the uh, town hall, if anyone has any questions, we'll be glad to bounce back to any questions for him. Looks like Hank has a question. And uh, I've unmuted your line, Hank. Go right ahead. Uh, I had a comment about uh, uh, the uh, presentation by uh, Timothy Cruz on his uh, answers at the end to question four. Made, uh, he included going to an emergency room. Now, early on in this pandemic, they had stated that you should not rush to an emergency room. Uh, you should first contact your physician and find out where the physician wants you to go. Because they didn't want everybody dashing into emergency rooms and just overwhelming the emergency room. And I think that's still appropriate to, to, to do in this, in this situation. I tried to make it clear she was like having a situation where she couldn't breathe at all. So that would be more of a situation where I would probably bypass that and just go straight to the emergency room if she was really to the point where she was unable to breathe like that. But typical, just right, regular shortness of breath that 
they've had before because they have heart failure because they've had other things that might not necessarily need to go straight to the emergency room. But this was a, when I had the question in mind, it was more severe than, than that. And I know Hank, like here in Springfield, um, specifically I know Memorial and I believe St. John's both does, they have actually taken their primary respiratory screening clinics off site from the main hospital campus. And they have a couple of them um, throughout the community where um, people can get tested that aren't, don't have any other emergent needs. Um, and they're running them, I think, a 12 hour shift. They run from like eight to eight. Um, so I think that's probably how some of the other health systems are doing it as well. Just trying to, again, as you said, not trying to overload the, the emergency department because the last thing we want to do is overflow the hospital right now with unneeded um, patients. Abby, go right ahead. There you go, Abby. Yeah, thank you so much for another excellent presentation, Tim. Well done. I just wanted to make sure that as we're uh, accepting the responsibility to do the testing, I think we want to ensure the appropriate training as um, we, we saw in the presentation. But I also want to encourage us to think of a sustainable business model. We don't want to do the same thing we've done in the past where we step up to the plate, we provide services, and we never really got reimbursement for these services. So I'm hoping this time we'll get the services reimbursement that we deserve. Thank you, Abby. We definitely agree with that. That's one of the reasons why I know during um, one of the NASPA discussions on this earlier this week, the states were all adamant that we keep this out of the PBM's hands and that we need to run this through the medical insurance side and make sure that we're recognized as providers so we can kind of knock a lot of birds, a lot of, lot of stones and birds out of the way so we can get what we've been trying to accomplish for a number of years. And if this is what we got to use to do that, let's take the, the opportunity to be able to get the, the right process put into place. And I know that's what's Starlin and I and, and a lot of others are trying to help figure out right now how we can do that without it being a six month period of trying to get everything online. Um, all right, I, I do have a couple of other things that I want to um, review with everyone, some changes for this week, um, since the last time we were all together, and then we'll just open it up for other questions. Um, so let me switch over first to, um, the Chrome browser. We had a question come in via text about um, technician testing. As of right now, uh, the only one I know that has made a statement was PTCB, and they issued a statement this week um, that they are offering testing um, remotely, and it's through an online proctoring service. And it looks like right now there is some temporarily reduced fees also. Um, so if you have technicians who are we're, we're getting prepared to take the exam, it uh, looks like PTCB has figured it out. I haven't seen anything from NHA yet, but I would assume they would be having something here pretty soon so that we can also address with that. And if anyone's seen anything, please go ahead and pass it along. As we know, there's a lot of information going on, and sometimes it's hard to get up, get a hold of everything. But at least for PTCB, they did announce some um, a, a remedy for 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 right now for their for their applicants. Just as a reminder for everyone, in case you haven't seen the, the current data, we did hit over the two million mark in cases today. Um, the United States is at six hundred thirty six thousand cases, and when we look at Illinois. Illinois is it now at just under 25,000 cases, and um, we are just under 1,000 deaths. Um, we will probably um, reach both of those levels probably by tomorrow or the next day, unfortunately, the way the, the spread is continuing to expand. 
Um, the, the governor and the director of public health have stated, and so does Chicago Public Health, that they feel that the curve is starting to bend, but we haven't completely flattened out yet. And um, we're making progress, but that still doesn't mean that we're not getting people affected. We're not losing people, unfortunately. Currently, as of today, 89 of the 102 counties now have at least one case. Um, and we can see on here the green counties are the only ones that do not have a case as of yet. So um, the this, this state has almost been completely impacted um, by, by the virus. For those that have been following along since we started using the Western Illinois um, dashboard for some of the data, we know that the original peak date, uh, remember some of the models was trying to peak Illinois at a, all the way out to April 20th. And then the one that um, a lot of people were going with, and so was the governor's office, was saying that it was supposed to happen on Easter. Um, now, it looks like we actually um, peaked a little um, early, which is good, on April 18th, and um, excuse me, on April 8th. So technically, we're now to, we're now a week past peak. Um, but as we see, we're still, you know, dealing with um, a number of cases. And we probably will be for a, a good amount of time because remember when we're looking at data and modeling, what we're seeing today is usually about two weeks behind where we really are. Plus, as we've talked about with testing, we still don't know exactly how many people are truly um, infected. If we go into the social distancing map, we are still not doing a good job as a country. Um, we are today, we're at a C. Um, if we look at Illinois specifically, um, we are at a D plus. And a lot of these counties, um, as you can see here in the Metro East, we're at, a, at an F. Um, even some of the, the counties, Grendel and, Kin, and Kinsey are, or Kindle are um, at an F, and a lot of the rest of us are not doing that well. So we have a lot of work to do continue to try to encourage everyone um, that that is not necessarily need to be out and about try to keep encourage your patients to please stay home when they can to please take advantage of your delivery services and with that I'm going to switch over to some issues that have changed in the last 24 hours as you remember on April 3rd the CDC finally issued some guidelines for specifically for considerations for pharmacies. And you know that we issued a statement that we still felt that these were very weak, but we were glad to see that the FDA was finally starting to realize that pharmacy was not a low risk category. They did make some recommendations on in engineering controls and administrative controls, and we felt they still weren't up to the standards of what we were recommending to um, pharmacies with our recommendations to the association and um, and then you know at, but the big change happened yesterday is that as of April 14th everyone entering a pharmacy the CDC is recommending should be wearing a mask covering regardless of their symptoms it doesn't matter if they are someone who is maybe positive or may have been exposed, everyone in your pharmacy should be wearing covering coming into your store, if you're still allowing um, customers into your store. Cloth face coverings should not be placed on children under age of two, and of course, anyone with any trouble breathing, unconscious, incapacitated, or unable to remove their mask without assistance um, is, should not have a cloth um, mask either. Bullet point two is, is extremely important, and this is something that we've been saying for over a month, is that pharmacists and technicians should, be wear, should have access to PPE and should always be wearing a face mask while they're in the pharmacy for source control. So we need to be pushing with your supervisors and managers that the CDC has escalated their guidance. We know a lot of organizations have shared this. We've shared it out as much as we can 
um, through the stakeholders. Of course, we'll be sending this out through the membership after this uh, call. But we want to make sure that everyone understands that we need to make sure that we're trying to protect pharmacists and, and technicians with at least some sort of face mask. Um, as we stated earlier, you need to be postponing or rescheduling the delivery of any routine clinical services, such as immunizations, that require any face-to-face -face encounters. And if you happen to be a pharmacy that has an in-store clinic, there are some special considerations. And let me get down to that section here. The clinic needs to have their own signs at the door instructing clinic patients with respiratory illness to return to their vehicles or remain outside. They are not to enter the store. That's one thing to remember. If you have a clinic and you have patients with respiratory illness, they are not to enter your store. They need to call the phone number for the clinic so the clinic can triage them and then take appropriate action before they are allowed in. Face masks and cloth coverings should be provided again to all patients if they are not already wearing one and ideally prior to entering the store. And where possible, if you have separate entrances for your clinic patients, otherwise make sure you have a clear path from the main door to the clinic for those patrons. And, and you may need to erect any physical barriers to minimize contact with other customers. These patients need to be going directly to the clinic and nowhere else. So we are glad to see the CDC finally recognize the exposure risk of pharmacies and making appropriate recommendations. And we have to applaud the, the, the feedback that I know many of you have provided through social media, through to us, and through any elected representatives. This was a all communication effort with the CDC to get them to understand that pharmacists deserve to be protected, that our technicians deserve to be protected, and we have to protect our patients and be protected from our patients. One last thing on PPE, any temporary, uh, this is an FDA policy that came out, I think late last week on Friday, that temporary policy regarding non-standard PPE practices for sterile compounding. If you are still compounding and you're um, already conserving PPE and you need to start looking at any alternate non-standard uses, the FDA has given you some guidance and additional documentation that you may need to do. So please do take a look at that if you're doing sterile compounding and are already into the practice of um, doing conservation methods for PPE. And remember, the, the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation through the Board of Pharmacy um, made recommendation that pharmacies in Illinois should be using the USP standards for co conservation of PPE. And let's see, one other thing I was wanting to bring up, because I know we haven't seen it as much with pharmacies as we have with doctors and nurses. And I want to be completely clear, not as much to the people on the call, but to their supervisors and managers. If you know of pharmacists or technicians who have been terminated or punished because of their wish to be protected, we need to know about it so we can help connect them with filing complaints with the Department of Financial and Professional Regulation and to getting them in contact with um, pharmacist attorneys that we have relationships with with the association. Because these type of practices are not going to be stood for in the state of Illinois. We have to protect our people. We have to make sure that we're protecting our patients. And because something may not look right for somebody's stupid metric, it is not going to be something that stands right now. Um, someone said their sneeze guards are 22 by 36 um, inches. This is from the counter to the ceiling is 65 inches. Again, that may be more of just expediency. I, the, the, the guidance in the FDA, let me, or the CDC, let me switch back to that real quick. I know they did talk about plastic barriers, and I don't know if they gave specific guidance on coverage. Um, 
They said the, the shield against droplets from coughs and coughs and sneezes. Install a section of clear plastic at the cu customer contact area to provide barrier protection. Plexiglass or clear plastic. Um, configure with a pass through at the bottom. It doesn't talk about anything else to the top. So um, again, that's something to bring up with supervisors. If there's a need that feel like you need additional measures that you may need to use additional clear plastic sheets. I know uh, many pharmacies were using even clear shower curtains as additional um, protection measures for right now. Um, let's see here. That's the only updates I had for you. I wanted to make sure um, we're hitting all of your questions. And I know we kind of dominated the conversation a little bit last week. Um, so I want to make sure to give some of that time back to everyone. And we've got plenty of time here. So any questions, any additional questions, you guys have been uh, putting them active in the chat tonight, but not too active in wanting to talk on the microphone. So uh, please raise your hand and we'll be glad to address any of your questions. Not everyone at once. Hey, guys. I see Laura waving. Oh, there you go. Go ahead, Laura. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see everyone. I think I've been inside for three days straight now, so this is really good for my soul. Um, is there, so just to give a quick update, um, I am at Roosevelt University, and we have identified that you cannot, as we alluded to with PTCB, do uh, NAPLEX testing unproctored uh, in the courtesy of your own home. I, that is, it has not gotten to that point yet. Um, so I know Garth, we had tried to explore um, if there were a way to, you know, process applications with approval of the Board of Pharmacy, Illinois Board of Pharmacy, uh, to kind of do some paperwork virtually. Or have, has there been any updates on 2020 PharmD grads and how they'll be able to even sit for the test and process their paperwork? No, there hasn't. And we're, there's actually a possibility that there may be a call um, with the DFPR tomorrow amongst pharmacy stakeholders. Um, what organization is that acronym? Oh, the Illinois Department of Financial Professionals, Board of Pharmacy. Oh, oh, DFPR. <laughs> got it. Okay, sorry. Yeah, DFPR. Yeah, and um, so there's a possibility of a call either tomorrow or the next day um, on a myriad of issues. This is one of them that they have not. The expediency of the department on a lot of this has been near molasses. It didn't change overnight. That. Yeah, I, I, I wish we had some expediency that we're seeing from other states because uh, um, some of the things that we need to be acting on, especially with the, how the schools are getting close in their semester. Um, we do know that U of I, for instance, already graduated some of their medical students early. And um, I don't know if any of the colleges, well, well, they couldn't because they haven't been able to process those applications with the department if they wanted to graduate some of them early. Um, but still trying to go through that process of what that may look like if we have um, pharmacists students that are going to be out and about. What else we, can we be doing with them? The, the plus and minuses of whether we uh, would allow them early licensure without the exam. There's a lot of questions about accreditation, how that would impact accreditation, how that would impact um, the um, accreditation for, and the stature of the NAPLEX exam. I'm, for those of you who are on um, our first town hall, uh, Jan Engel from ACPE kind of touched on some of those questions that are still being pursued. Um, yeah, I know that I saw that Purdue is graduating some students early. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's it's good to see that some of the schools are looking at this, but again, if we can't get them tested, it doesn't matter that we get them done now or get them done later. Um, Sabi said she had a question here or a statement, I think. Do you want to give kudos to the pharmacists at the Kumine Clinic at Christ Hospital in Oakland who are doing curbside INR checking? Yeah, that is, that's nice, doing that uh, cool, safe, and convenient. That's, that's really cool. I know that we set up a, uh, um, 
I know one, I think Springfield Clinic is doing some drive through um, labs here as well. And, and Starlin's added that some other um, folks are doing, oh, um, Brennan and Sarah and Gary are doing uh, drive through INR as well. So Gary Moreland, I'm assuming. And over indicator as well. Just to give you a heads up on next week's topic, we're going to actually be talking about um, personal well being and trying to take care of yourself as we try to handle stress management during this time that's on top of our normal stress management that we're trying to take care of for ourselves. We know this has been a very hard month for a lot of us, and we need to make sure that we're keeping ourselves healthy for our patients as much as well as for ourselves. So um, Saneha will be uh, uh, helping us with that topic next week, and um, we're also working on a couple other um, options that hopefully we can announce by that time next week as well. We still got about nine minutes scheduled, so if anyone has any questions or anyone else wants to, to chip in. Starlin, I don't know if there's anything else that you're wanting to fill in from some of the, the meetings that you've been involved with this week. Yo, go ahead. Unmute me. There you go. Okay, sorry. I, every time I click on the thing, it 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 we have a lot of people on the call. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. I just want you to know that if you are a PSMP coach or you are a pharmacist that are working with diabetes patients, um, we have resources. I've sent them out to the coaches to do uh, well-being checks on all the patients with diabetes. Our city of Chicago folks have their hands full because um, the, the patients are stuck at home and they don't, they actually uh, only have our pharmacist coach to reach out to. So we've been uh, using um, the American Diabetes Care and Education Specialist, formerly known as AADE. They've been producing lots of resources um, and, and we have been, uh, ADA has some great resources. So there's some really reputable resources out there for not just diabetes patients, but for any of your patients that are stuck at home and um, are concerned, um, if you need some, you can reach out to me and at my email or let me know, let us know now. The other thing is, is we've been uh, refining the telehealth option. Pharmacists and nurses still cannot deliver Medicare diabetes training via telephone or televisual so that um, there's a, a letter that is um, on the diabetes educator site that it's just like it goes to your senator and your congressman to encourage them to add our name because 50 percent of the diabetes education centers in the united states are ran by pharmacists and or nurses or together um, an, another Another big deal is um, I, I have to give my hats off to the national organizations. They're working really, really well together. They're all at the table. They're all, um, I mean, all around, every pharmacy silo is at the table and I'm very proud of them. So if you don't belong to something, please join us <laughs> because um, we, need, we need your help and we need, uh, your membership revenue and your membership letters and your personal ex expertise to help us move us to that point. If you don't feel the crush that's been on pharmacy today, this is, this is the worst in my 44 years of being in pharmacy that I've ever seen our, our profession and we really need to go to bat for each other and for our profession and for our associations. Um, they're really, um, you, 
it, it sounds very silent all the time because they nobody blows the whistles and 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 brings in the band but um i'm i'm here to tell you that i'm up at 5 30 in the morning for the east coast things and as you all know i don't go to bed till three in the morning anyway but um i'm i'm very proud of our pharmacy associations i'm very proud of every single one of you i'm extremely proud of the 16,000 future pharmacists we're going to graduate so hang in there keep up the good work if you need something the only way we know you need something is for you to communicate with us so email us facetime us uh facebook us twit us tweet us whatever whatever means you can communicate reach out to laura reach out to garth reach out to Bo. Um, we've got a great board, executive board. We've got great representatives. Hank is is like our our best uh, pharmacy dude. He'll listen to your stories. We need to collect these. We need to get them out there, and we need to hear what you need. There's my soapbox. Fire up for pharmacy. <laughs> Thank you, Starlin. And just to kind of dovetail again on what Starlin was saying about the national organizations. Um, the national organizations are actually, ha they have a daily conference call between the CEOs every morning to kind of talk about the issues of the day um, based on a lot of that, that closeness that's been going on right now and a lot of the feedback yesterday. That's one of the reasons why we got a less than 24-hour turnaround on Senator Schumer's um, misstep in his statements that we're, because of his work with pharmacies before specifically from the experience that we've heard from the state of New York that um, we, we we do know that that seemed to be probably a staffers misstep in the in the communication but we're glad to see that it got pharmacies fired up at least we at least we know that people are paying attention I'm glad to see people advocating for once and actually reading reaching people out I saw more letters and, and tweets out on that now we just need to get them doing it about PBMs and keep talking about all the abuses that keep going on. So we just got to keep it up. Now we just got to keep that fire going on other things. Um, two quick things. One, we'll be sending out a um, a link from NCPA. They, um, as you know, Congress is in recess right now, and they will. They, um, um, the NCPA is working with a number of congressmen on a DIR letter, another DIR letter. I know we've asked you a lot about trying to get your congressman on these letters. Um, I believe uh, Congressman um, Christian Morty is actually uh, one of the, with working with Buddy Carter on this newest letter. And we have a number of our congressmen already signed on. And a lot of that is because of the involvement of people on this call. And I want to thank you for that. Um, Bo is asking if we've heard any, any word on the recommendations from the governor. No, uh, not yet. That is probably what our call is going to be about tomorrow um, with IDFDR, hopefully trying to get some additional issues. Um, and then Laura said, also, have there been any press on PBMs continuing higher copays for patients? that go out of network even though there is shelter in place. Um, I will ask that out to everyone here on the call. Has anyone seen patients receiving any higher co-pays because they may be going out of network right now? Um, if so, we need to be submitting those as complaints to the PBMs. We need to be submitting those as complaints to um, HFS if it's a Medicaid individual, and we need to be seeing those to the Attorney General as well. So, Garth, um, go ahead. So, hey, everyone. And since I'm not in practice, this was on a group text I had today that uh, I encouraged everyone to send that in to IPHA and to please, um, you know, we need to bring this stuff to light. That's absolutely com completely insane that there is a shelter in place order and you are going to have to pay a higher copay for going out of network at a time like this. Right. I know that it, there has been a lot of issues with just insurance and COVID-19 altogether. Um, a lot of both medical and on the PBM side not wanting to do what these state orders are telling them to do. Um, we're seeing a lot of people still be uh, have unfortunate COVID patients getting extremely high medical bills. 
even though a lot of that uh, paperwork yeah, are th those services are supposed to be covered under these executive orders. And then um, we're still working on some of these issues, including the Blue Cross contract, trying to get the Department of Insurance to come to the table. It's very difficult on anything that's not COVID related or is not completely on fire, threatening to burn down the building to get anybody to do anything that's not a high priority topic right now, uh, mainly because of a lot of their staff being remote. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're still not pushing them on it. Um, I've already put in a complaint to HFS about this new complaint process that they have in place, that it really um, is not allowing pharmacies to have a true voice in, in, the, in the process of these issues as we see them. And it's really slowing things down, especially with the PDM, MCOs in particularly, not um, having established processes for pharmacies to be able to complain so that they have to complain to them first and then complain back to the department. Um, Rupesh, I know you had your hand up for a while and I'm sorry about that, but go right ahead. I, I'm not sure, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you're good. You know, I mean, our cost of dispensing a prescription all of a sudden has just jumped so high because our deliveries have tripled in, in number. We have to stop our, our, we have to equip our staff with all the PPEs, which we are buying right now at a much higher price than they should be. And our dispensing fee is still the same. Is there anything being asked to the PBM on how they are planning to change that during the COVID-19 or is there something that they, that's under consideration for us? There has been a consideration specifically on delivery costs that has been allowed federally that would allow HFS, if they elected to, to pay for an enhanced delivery fee. One of the issues that a lot of states have been trying to, that have tried to do this is because most of you offered delivery for free. And the respected state Medicaid's are like, well, if it's free already, why should we pay any enhanced fees? And so we're, we're working with HFS, there's been some I'll say right now there's been some conversations because of a webinar that CMS um, presented last week that may have they may have accidentally opened the door wider than they ever anticipated opening and may actually allow associations to directly file 1135 waivers without the department's comment or approval. So we have two states that have friendly relationships with their Medicaid department. So in case they, this completely falls apart, um, and they are hopefully going to be submitting those in the next week. Um, we're already starting to pull information together um, to submit to see what we can get. Um, it could, you know, this isn't the best way of going around the department um, without repercussions later on. Um, but if this is what we have to resort to to get things done, this is what we'll do. Um, it's very interesting that CMS would take any type of waiver or adjustments to the Medicaid plan that would have taxpayer dollar repercussions without it actually coming from the state. So we're still working with the department in many of these different ways. Um, it's just, as we know, our Medicaid system in Illinois, I won't sugarcoat it, sucks. And they do not like pharmacy. They don't want to pay for anything that they don't want to pay for. And they mistreat all of their healthcare providers that are attached to the network. And there needs to be a fundamental reshaping of what Illinois Medicaid looks, looks like after all this is said and done. Um, Emily, you had a question. Our, what are we doing? A, go our, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is Al Evans. I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, I yeah. um, wanted to uh, give you a, a kudos for you and the association for all the hard work you do. Great job. Um, as you. far as you just made a statement when you were talking about the PBMs, you said that they don't want to start paying for something that was free. That Why should they pay for it now? Well, Everything that was free yesterday is not free today. So that's Absolutely. exactly why they should start paying for it. Now, the next thing I wanted to say is about that uh, something that may not be that important, but 
it goes along with a little bit of what Abby said earlier in the um, uh, session. Uh, uh, hazardous pay for pharmacists. That may not be that important uh, up front because we want to be good servants to our patients and to the profession. But if they're going to start requiring us to test or allowing us to test, let me rephrase that, that should be the door opener that we should get reimbursement for that for some kind of way. Because with immunizations, pharmacists have been given the immunizations and we don't get one penny for that. And I think that unfortunately, we're in a time of, of uh, a serious health crisis. But when you're fighting in wars, Sometimes you have to uh, cut out a, a piece of the pie. Uh, and I think if they're gonna want or allow us to do testing, we need to, in my opinion, uh, find a way where we can be uh, compensated for that. And lastly, I wanted to ask you about that situation. You had a list last week of things that were on the table. And one of the things that um, was on the table that made me feel uncomfortable was allowing anyone in the pharmacy. And I wanted to understand how that has, uh, get a, you know, feedback on how that is moving forward. And thank you all um, for all you do. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you, Al. As for the five recommendations that we made to the governor's office, um, one of them was talking about allowing anyone behind the counter. Right now, there hasn't been any action on any of those recommendations. Again, we've been told that we're gonna be having a call with them hopefully tomorrow or the next day. Um, the reason why we were recommending allowing anyone behind the counter is we were, as we're hopefully, we're not going to get there. And I'm glad I'm, I'm hopefully, so crossing my fingers, I'm glad I'm being wrong. That we don't need everyone to help out in the pharmacy. We were doing that as a precautionary measure because we felt that as more people would get sick and get infected, that pharmacy staffs would be dwindled down and that we would need to be asking non-pharmacy staff in our stores to help out behind the counter, um, especially with uh, reaching out um, for any deliveries or any of the curbside services. Um, so there hasn't been any a formal action from the governor's office as of yet or the department. Um, question of the statement there about testing hazard sounds like a good argument for or set for provider status. Um, someone said, Al, that they agree with you. Um, I think if we're not asking for the same thing as the other health professions about getting as far as pay and protection, the whole shebang, it just reinforces the false idea that we're, we aren't practicing the same as other medical professions. Again, I agree with you. And again, I also challenge you. How many of you are charging for patient counseling on a daily basis right now? We've asked the department, reminder, we asked that back in 2017, once when it became mandatory, whether we could charge for it. The department said that there was no, there was no language that pro would prohibit it. And technically nothing's prohibited it since over 90. So we continue to give things away for free. We have to stop doing that. Um, I see we have a cat co-star, or a special spot down there in Florida. Um, do we have any other questions? I know we, we went a little over time now, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know some of us could talk on here for hours about what's going on. I, the one last thing I want to ask real quick, and some of you can just put this into comments or emails to me. We're continuing to work with wholesalers and with the Department of Public Health on medication shortages, um, specifically medications that are in shortage to the health systems. And we're trying to find some ways of, um, trying to find alternate ways of helping the state get access to certain medications. but. As we know that China is still trying to come back online, we know that India is starting to loosen up some of its stay-at-home processes. 
are we seeing an expansion of any traditional medications that would normally not be in shortage? Are we starting to see a shortage of it? it again, if you don't have time to put it in the chat, or if anyone wants to raise their hand real quick and talk about some of them, just let me know because these are issues that why we're pushing to allow pharmacists to be able to do therapeutic interchange during this time because it is our thought that we are going to have an expansion of medication shortages and um, we need to make sure that we're staying ahead of the game. Laura, I know you're on mute. Hey, Garth, thanks. Um, Emily asked a good question about what are we doing about pharmacists or techs not being able to work but also not being able to receive hazard pay because they're, they're not able to get tested. That's a big question, just because a lot of testing places are, it's 10 days before you get a, you get a turnaround on the test. And this is a major issue. And it's one of, that's been compounded this week because the um, JCAR approved a Joint Commission for Administrative Rules published an emergency rule greatly and vastly expanding workers' compensation, and possibly illegally. It stated that if a worker, an essential worker, gets COVID-19, the intention of the rule was if they would get it on from being on the work site, that it would be covered under workers' comp. Right now, without proper testing, there is no way to know if the employee got it from the work site because you can't test the employee. You can't test any of the people they interacted with. You can't test any of the customers they were around. So you have no tracing to know whether they got it at the workplace. But if it's being put onto the workplace, that is an almost $2 million cost per person. So there's going to be a, a lot of companies may have to make really drastic decisions here and could see a lot more layoffs if this workers' comp rule stands to protect the businesses. So it's, it's very difficult. The rule, there's been some, um, the LA Manufacturers Association, and I know Irma, um, have, have filed um, legal complaints against it because of that it goes outside what a uh, an emergency rule would be. Um, it, it, it because it an emergency rule is not to be taken place of the legislative process, and the legislative process there have been bills to try to address similar things like this, specifically with firefighters and MRSA exposure. And so this seems like an overstep, and it's one that I think will be addressed because it went around the emergency the executive orders. It was used in the JCAR emergency rules process. So we're just not sure how this rule is going to stand, and every interpretation I've seen of it tries to say that it's for workers who get COVID-19 on the job, but that's not what the rule says. And so there's going to be a lot of fighting and I think a lot of unnecessary court battles on this because it goes back to my statement from earlier. Why do we need the workers' compensation rule if the insurance companies are supposed to be paying for it all in the first place? So, and with already with the CARES Act, there already should be enough sick days to cover for almost all cases the time that they would be out from their workplace. So th there's a lot of considerations that we have to look at. And also just because I know it uh, may not be in, in sight for a lot of people, but we did join a number of business associations, including the Illinois Chamber, the Illinois Manufacturer Association in, in PERMA, and a letter to Governor Pritzker asking for a delay in the minimum wage increase on July 1. We think this is an unnecessary increase in burden expense on businesses during this time. And, you know, we, we have a stance that we've been against the minimum wage increase just because of since pharmacies are not properly reimbursed. It is a very economic issue that we're going to have to look at. It's not saying that we don't believe in paying for our staff, 
It's just right now with the current model, it makes it hard for a lot of businesses to be able to look at that. And so we have to look at alternate ways until this whole system is fixed so we can help out everybody appropriately. Um, Starling, you said tomorrow, can we suggest that pharmacists be involved in the contact tracing in Illinois? Um, and contact, can you talk about what you're talking about there? So contact tracing is, um, and, and we, we had other people ask the same question. I know we're working at it at the national level, but if, if we were able to provide the advocacy of tra tracking where people have been, especially oh, people yeah. that have been oh, in, in our call with the in our call with the government? Yes. If, oh, yes, that's already been on my list because I was listening to um, the governor of Oregon talk about how they need to hire 100 different people just to be able to get started. And I'm sitting there going, well, we've got about 300 student graduate pharmacists that are going to be, gonna be um, that could be helping out getting on the phones here. Right. And, and so, um, especially I, as they're coming into the pharmacies and then people are finding out, I mean, just like uh, Timothy's great case presentations, person shows up in your pharmacy, thinks they've been exposed, the contact tracing could start then. Everybody gets a, uh, I mean, we're already, finally we all get masks, but then that whole process could, could, could be rolled into place like it was set up to do originally in our, our, our plans and our catastrophe plans. For right. It, and I think there is a role for us to play on this and hopefully, because I know the governor has been saying um, very recently about testing, tracking, treatment, uh, which is what was a success in South Korea. And I'm glad to hear him say it the last couple of days. And hopefully that helps with uh, setting up a good um, process for everyone to be involved. Um, we're also working some with some other alternatives that are a little outside the box and trying to get more access to PPE. Um, in addition to that, I do want to remind everyone that um, the foundation is accepting donations for PPE. And, you know, of course, we've sent it out on social media and to the membership, but we know that isn't getting to a lot of people that have access to PPE. Um, if you can send it out within your community, um, the email that we sent out from the foundation, because um, I know Mickey brought up um, last week that a number of schools have supplies because of some of the classes that they teach. So if you can share it out in your communities or maybe some organizations that never didn't think about that, oh yeah, they've actually got supply of these needed materials. We'd be glad to take those in through the association, through the foundation, and trying to get those back out to pharmacies as we try to wait for the supply chain to catch up to everybody. I know we went 15 minutes over now. Is there any other last minute questions? Um, could you say something about Fisker about reopening the golf course? <laughs> All right. Well, I, I know golf courses have been a real hit, hit r real uh, comment about. Um, I know even back home where I'm from, that's been a uh, a big issue about uh, golf courses not being allowed to be open since they said that golfers could be out ten feet from each other. So, um, I look at it as you know we need to make sure people are getting exercise and being socially responsible. So if it can be done appropriately, hell, why not? So. Um, any last minute questions or comments? If not, thank you everyone. And we will see you again next Wednesday. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you all again for everything that you're doing. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.